A little different presentation from the Dr. Pearl presented, and it'll be more sort of big picture in terms of what we are expecting and to see in terms of diagnostics once we are moving ahead for changing some of our policy in terms of using uh, growth promoter in, in, the, in the swine industry. And I was discussed with Bob, uh, about, the, Bob Morrison, about the presentation and it uh, has been really challenging to really guess what's going to happen in terms of <coughs> next year once we got started in removing and some of the system we have, systems we have seen that's already starting moving ahead and take it off and take it off the, the growth promoter um, from the feed, the sub therapeutic doses on the feed, especially in growing and finishing pigs. So it's, it's you know, consulting the crystal ball and see what you come up with. So the, the story that I would like to, to tell you here is more a little bit of the history and why we are starting using growth promoter and uh, of course the European experiencing in terms of what they are dealing with, in terms of disease incidents up and before and after the banning, uh, some of the US scenario that we have seen in our database at the diagnostic lab, and after that some comparison and considerations regarding a potential future scenarios that we can or could face uh, from next year on. So uh, basically everything really started in the early 1940s where they are feeding uh, chicken with uh, fermentation waste from tetracycline but the first initially the intent was to give a more booster in terms of vitamin B12 and they started calling that an animal protein factor and then they look further on that and they find out that it was really making that the, the chickens grow or perform better was the residual tetracycline uh, present on the fermentation or after the fermentation of that. There's a kind of interesting story about the what they call animal protein factor and then afterwards they, they 1915s they, they look at other pigs and they see pretty much the same or similar uh, results that they have seen first incidentally on, on, on the chicken. So, uh, regarding the resistance and the uh, growth promoter, or the use of antimicrobial as a growth promoter, they started to look at closer in mid 1960, and by the end of the 60, 60 uh, they come up with uh, actually this research here from UK, come up with a report regarding some concerns and about the use of antimicrobial as a growth promoter. And they come up with some recommendations, and they thought at that point already, that has sufficient sound or basis for action regarding the restrictions on the use of the growth promoter. So, a couple of the three recommendations uh, about the use with the, the ones that has little or no application on, for purpose in human and animals, no impair on the efficacy on prescribing therapeutic drugs for developing resistance, this is kind of the second one, kind of hard to achieve. Uh, and already at that time, they're talking about some specifics antimicrobial that has been used, for example, the thylacine has been used and they are talking about some restrictions. So there's, there was a huge impact regarding that report at that time and some of the countries take some actions and uh, one country actually takes more serious action and the other ones more inaction in terms of considering some of the restrictions. And as we can see here, the UK and some of the other countries keep using thylacine and spermicine and it will be seen as a growth promoter and in the sense that then the, some of the countries that take some serious action was Sweden that driving pretty much by the consumers and some of the association for the farmers and then the, the growth promoter, the completely then the growth promoter in 1986. And the story in terms of the cascade for banning all the, the growth promoter in the European countries starting with the vancomycin uh, which was discovered in the 1960s, but it was a really concern and why we use any humans in, in the 80s and then found in humans and animals in the beginning of the 90s. And, but the phycomycin per se was not used or widely used, commonly used in the humans on the food animal side. So, but then 
we found that uh, another similar eicopeptide known as microbial avoparsin that was widely used in the food animal and the mechanism for resistance was similar to the vancomycin. So the vancomycin would be more applicable for the human side and the avoparsin for the food animal side. So this year, uh, global model was banned in 1997 and then the all other group promoters or the use of, group of antimicrobial as a group promoter was banned in different times in Europe and getting the end in the European Union in, in 2006. And so how are we going to measure the, we are talking more about the disease and my background is pretty much diagnostic. So how are we going to measure the, the incidence of the disease or diagnostics and after or before or after the banning of antimicrobial? You can look at the production data and the general mortality average of that again, and we're not going to deep on that. It's just a general pattern of changing if there is any changing. And you can look at the diagnostic data. So we have lab assessions, uh, assessions. So you can have high specificity in the sense that you got the isolate or you got the answer in terms of what is the animal has been affected clinically, and then. However, we have questionable sensitivity in a sense that the majority of the, or it's a common practice that you put uh, or increase the antimicrobial in the feed, but not sending tissues to the lab. So we have this double two considerations on in terms of that. And we have also some confounders that if you have the, lab, the diagnosed data uh, driving by an emerging disease, uh, surveillance, detection versus disease. For example, we have an increase in isolation of E. coli in 2013, and that was because of the PED, more fecal samples coming in, so we have some those type of confounders. And we also have an indirect method to, to measure the occurrence of disease, and that's one of the reasons that, one of the methods that they take in Europe, and consider that you're only gonna use it microbial for therapeutic use or preventive, purposes after the banning, and then you can look at specific syndromes, so we were, you are recording the amount of antimicrobial usage, and then you are targeting some specific clinical syndrome, so you can use a specific antibiotic, so you can ask for via diarrhea, pneumonia, uh, or cirrhosis, or septicemia, arthritis, or CNS signs, so you can record or try to record the disease by, on that way. And regarding the feed, uh, regarding the production data, this is uh, one of the experience that the dynamite has. Here we have the, uh, the ear of the penny, and the, the black one is the increase in mortality. Here is just general data. So increasing mortality, we don't know where is mortality is looking, is it in the finishing, is it in the nursery, or, or is it the, the growing pigs. And we have the average of data again here. So we got a little up here, and then we got up under control around 2005 and 2004. Or you can also look at the overall trends in terms of antimicrobial consumption on those countries that banned the, the antimicrobial use for global water. So for example, the Sweden was the first one, so we got, they struggled a little bit on the first four or five years, and then the decreasing of the consumption and starting here after, here's the banning, so 1986, and then starting the real uh, decreasing after four or five, five years. That was a little different from, from Norway, where they, and they blame a really strong educational program in the, with the vets and the producers, and some of the lessons learned from the Sweden, and they started to see a more aggressive decreasing even uh, at the time of the banning. When you look at the Denmark uh, data, you see a trend increasing on the therapeutic use, so the, the blue bar here, are the therapeutic use, and the purple one was when the ban happened in 2000, 19, 2000 here. And here's the focus that I just want to mention that increasing on the use for therapeutic use, and then you start to see a decrease in 2010 and 11 when additional policies play some roles on that. And here's one was implemented the yellow card scheme. I don't know, maybe some of you are familiar with that where you have a limit of use antimicrobial in a year or so. So, and kind of the same trend that happened in Netherlands where you have an increasing on the use of their therapeutic use of antimicrobial and then you have additional policies in 2007 and 8 
and they started the real decreasing and the, and the antimicrobial usage. And this is one of the lessons learned that we may take from that in our reality here, or our scenario here in the US, that only or the single or the simple ban on antimicrobial usage maybe is not enough to, to really see a, a, a decreasing of the general consumption. So what Denmark and Netherlands has tell us so far that it needs uh, a little more additional policies and regulation for that. So going up, here is just a general picture, right? So going forward and looking where actually increase the usage, the usage of it, of it, we can see here in this graph that the increase were more and big at the nursery or the winners, winners on the nursery phase. So we are narrowed down a little bit our discussion here in terms of uh, impact in the usage, and it was more on the winners, specifically on the nursery phase. And if you look at the data in Sweden. That after the, the, first, the, four, the first four year, uh, years after the pain, we got an increase in pulse, meaning diarrhea. We're not talking about any uh, bug so far, it's just a general pattern. And the five to six more days to reach the 25 kilograms and a little impact on the finishers. So, narrow down a little more what type of antimicrobial they use after the pain and why it's increasing on that. So, the first one here, maybe some of the back can. Not really looking at the names here. So the first one here is tetracycline, an increase or significance increasing, increasing on the on the nursery phase, and a little bit on the finishing, which is kind of compensated to the reduce it on the tidal, on the tidal scene. And so here is the target really that they deal with this. They're increasing on the mainly tetracycline and tidal scene on the on the nursery phase. Uh, kind of the same pattern on the Netherlands side, green, the red one is the, the tetracycline, and the green one is the, more the, the tyrosine, increasing, and then start to decreasing after the additional policies and regulations on the antimicrobial. Switzerland, they, they started, they banned in 1999, and there was really good impact on the, on the tyrosine here, but then increasing on the cholestine which is pretty much a replacement in terms of what they are dealing with that. And here at increasing the and CTC or tetracycline, and which is pretty good, but then increasing in sofa. So you have that, that balance you know, in, a, in order to avoid uh, the impact in terms of losses and uh, the bottom mortality. Uh, so you can look at the treatments and what this, this uh, group did was a really nice uh, article where they look at the treatment and they categorize why we are treating for. So diarrhea, uh, falling uh, behind, the treating, and arthritis, pneumonia, and miscellaneous, which include tail biting and so forth. And after, here we have the, man, the months before the banning and after the banning. And here we have pretty much the way they, the proportion of pigs treated. And if you look at the incidence of why we are treating or the risk of treatment, we don't see much here on the pneumonia side or miscellaneous or arthritis. We see here a PEC, which is more related with the PCV2 outbreak in, in Denmark. This data is from Denmark. When we look at the diarrhea data, we see a lot of more incidence. And then we are narrowing down the usage of antimicrobial on the nursery phase and for diarrhea. And then what, what, what has happened in terms of diarrhea, in terms of pathogens? And the focus is bacterial pathogen, and the first two, or the top three, two that they have experience in there, are at, this is the days after weaning, so 14 days, a lot of E. coli, and here we have the, pretty much the two uh, fibria type of E. coli, intertoxigenic E. coli, and then increasing on the Lausonia prevalence. And, uh, when you're talking about the Alzheimer prevalence, and I will discuss that a little bit later on, we have to talk about the PCR and how, 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 how strong the PCR are, and it kind of follows the same trend, increasing the prevalence and increasing the amount of Alzheimer by PCR. Another uh, bacteria that we haven't discussed much here in the US is Gratispira plus coli, and we haven't seen incidental cases, I would say, and we don't pretty much know um, how it's going to turn out in the next year or so. So what happens in terms of European experience for Gratispira or even Osonia, we have a, a, 
uh, cases on that earlier phase, we are in the classical brachiospiral or Alzona cases usually grow in finish and then the cases start to move into the nursery. So by the, the end of the nursery, we start to see more and more cases or, of, of those three um, agents. So a little bit about diagnostics. So we are, of course, uh, to look at those cases and enteric cases, we want to have a good sample to look at. That. So here, just as a educational slides, that it's important to have good and non-autolytic material to look at, especially when you talk about these three agents that we discussed. E. coli, when you can see or not, E. coli, the addition on the villi, same for Pilosicoli, and here is the IEC for Osona. So, at the beginning of the process, when we start investigating all the three ones, we have to have a good, a good sample for that. So, non-autolytic material is critical in those cases. E. coli, we are talking about enterotoxigenic E. coli, which means that we're not going to see much lesions on that. We are investigating more the presence of what we call virulence factors, which is usually a combination of aphibia, which is a factor that makes the E. coli to make the adhesion process here, and the enterotoxin, which makes the diarrhea for the E. coli. So the combination of those is the one that you look at uh, when you're trying to diagnose E. coli. So in some of the cases, we can see uh, CNS signs associated with microscopic lesions, but that was not be the most common scenario that you see. So that keep in mind that E. coli is still you know, a challenge for diagnosis for the lack of histopath lesions. So if you're in the lucky day, you can see some mucus type of diarrhea in E. coli cases or other just Fuel fluid uh, intestine with a little enlarger on the lymph nodes and congestion one. If the pathology is in the, in, in, the, in the right spot and a lucky day, you could also appreciate the presence of the E. coli and the V. coli. But this is, again, this is an exception. I mean, on the daily basis, we don't usually see that. We rely on the virulence factors, on these guys here, and usually the combination of one of the fibria, and here is the prevalence of the the, those two fibrias at 4 and at 18, and the combination with the enterotoxin. So, we, we see quite a few STB enterotoxin, which is more or less what they see here in the data from Denmark. And when we look at the F4, we also continue seeing STB or LD, that will be the two most prevalent. Again, diarrhea with lack or minimal uh, histopath or even microscopic lesion. Antimicrobial resistance, when you look at that, and that's the main reason we are talking about Benny and antimicrobial group of water, we see pretty much two groups where we have tetracycline, thymuline, and psyllin on the up. They are, here is the percentage, the percentage of uh, resistance and strengths, and, and here's the ear. Here, this is the data from the diagnostic lab, and I'm looking forward to see the data next year. But what strikes me here is just one feature from 2011. We see an increase on the enterofloxacin resistance going from almost zero here and now hitting the 20% of the isolates. Still learning from that. The next one will be the Brachyspira colitis. In Europe, they have a pretty good picture and now it's getting a little fuzzy because they're getting strains that are not pathogenic for. Uh, is Iodesenteria, and I'm not going to discuss that here, but where they have or they don't have, if they have, they usually treat it. On the Pilos coli, it's a milder colitis, where you see mucus on the colon, on the spiral colon, on the cecum. It's a weakly hemolytic, it's different in terms of diagnostic than p -hyo, and it's easy to treat when you can treat, right? When you can use some antibiotics on feed. Uh, we don't have, in terms of data from the VDL, uncommon sporadic case, and most of them when we are looking for p and not really p coli. So when you see, for example, eight, eight cases here, you see that this is probably part of one diagnostic investigation. So uncommon or really rare and not really patterned in terms of seasonality. When you look at antimicrobial susceptibility, as we go on your right, is the more resistance. So you have resistance for 
tyrosine, lincomycin, and a little bit for doxycycline. When you look at the data from Sweden, again, and my antimicrobial free scenario, you see that it's more susceptible to timeline, but it's kind of the same pattern when you look at for the tyrosine, for example. Lausonia, the classical picture for Lausonia is the growing finishing, where you have fecal PCR positive followed by serology. It's nice when you have the classical presentation, either, either acute or chronic, which is the challenge, is the subclinical one, and how we're going to decide next year how we're going to treat it for that. Are you going to treat it for all positive cases for PCR? We know that to increase Lausonia on the fecal PCR, you, you decrease the the grow rate. And if you increase the, the fecal PCR and it also increase the lesions. So you have pretty much you have a sort of cutoff for that. So in your y axis here, you have the amount of Lausonia in the feces. We don't usually look at those numbers in terms of 10 to the 5, 10 to the 6 per gram. We like CT values, right? So if you put it here on the curve and you extend a little bit the cutoff, use it for detection and lesions, that's what this graph shows, we end up doing, well, we may consider 30, 31 CT values for a clinical or at the time that I'm starting to, to, to treat. If you want to treat the whole, all the pigs that got positive PCR, and then you start to get a little complicated here, a little complex. And this is the case that we have since 2013 and 16, all the positive cases for Osonia, and the CT values on the y axis. We call this area here, which is, if you look at here, it's pretty much the, mall, the most populated area. We have suspect cases. And we have a really, considering the 30 31 cutoff, we have a bunch of re real positive cases. But we also have about 25% on those cases that we don't know what to do with that. Is that significance? Is not. We need more consistency on that. Uh, I'm just going to skip that in a matter of time because it's really hard to interpret it and, and I may not have the answer for that. Antimicrobial for Osonia, very limited data. And why is increasing the enteric bacterial infection and not the respiratory? We know there is the worst sign of respiratory disease complex driving primarily by virus, spurs, flu, and maybe exception would be the mycoplasma. And we know by treating those primary antigen, primary virus, by vaccination or elimination, we can pretty much get rid of the bacterial ones on a regular basis. And what about the poor sign in terrific disease complex? And we don't really have that. And, uh, and the reason we don't have that and probably because we don't understand much about that. And probably because of the complexity of the intestinal microbiota is way more complex than the respiratory microbiota. And Dr. Allen is going to talk about here. Uh, later on. So, scales matter. We have European experience with an average of 100 cells. So, here we have uh, a lot of more uh, large systems. Uh, systematic approach to measure the disease occurrence, and we are working on that with some of the, our uh, uh, veterinary clinic to, to look at to record the treatment for a specific syndrome. Management and strategy. For example, if you see the Europe, we see the, the winning age going up to 28 to 30 to management a little bit of the post meaning diarrhea. And here we have the 21, more or less blue. Some of the countries are active for births. We have a lot of positive here. The density is very low or low, and we have a high density here. The usage in general, especially in Denmark, for Lausanne vaccine is low, and here we use a lot of Lausanne vaccine, it may change our picture next year. And the carbidox is banned in, the, in Europe, and here it's using. We don't know yet how long, so we're going to keep using that. And partial restriction for the zinc oxide, and here we use a lot too. So in enteric bacteria, the big question is, and the message that I want to pass through, is that when to act? That would be one of the questions that we may have next year. Okay? <coughs> Lausonia positive, how much positive to justify the treatment and how long? For sure, if you treat it for Lausonia, you may or may not get rid of it in terms of getting negative results. You want to keep the positive results, the high CTs, and what to do with that. 
And then we live in Kikolai, we don't know much about that, how it's going to change here. We know that just the regulation for sin didn't change much in Europe experience. So we probably going to have long-term benefits as they are having there after additional regulations. Examples, yellow card regulations, the diet systems in Germany, and the Netherlands experience after 2007-2008. So it's more to come, additional regulations. Talking about that, last week, the regulations started to get a little more strict. We used to use those drugs at an undefined duration. And that's the plan to keep like that for the next year. But last year, looks like the regulation is changing and we have to reevaluate that we're going to have, for example, tyrosine to use as of now, probably going to turn out to be a defined duration where it started, where it finished.